Can we put up this scripture, please? Psalm 24 and verse 3. Psalm 24, verse 3. Just read uh, two verses, verses three and four. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Last week we started by looking at that verse and we were looking at how the one who wants to come into God's presence has to be clean. Can you remember? The one who has to, wants to come into God's presence and receive God's blessing has to, has to have a pure heart. This word clean and pure. And we looked last week about how God wants things clean. And we looked at those things last week. We'll mention them slightly again this morning. And... During the week, we had a short devotional on Wednesday because we couldn't meet. And once again, I, I just brought a short message about how God wants everything to be clean. At the beginning of the year, at the beginning of Passover, how God wants everything to be clean. And I also uploaded something on Facebook. I don't know if you saw it when it started to snow, talking about how um, snow is a picture of cl cleanliness in the Bible. Though your sins be as uh, red as scarlet, they will be as pure and clean as snow. Jesus in his purity, his clothes are described as white like the snow. His hair is described as white like the snow. God wants absolute purity and absolute cleanliness. There's no debating that. Um, they understood that. Baptism was a sign of cleanliness. Everything in the temple and the Bible was a sign of being clean. Yeah? Yeah? So to come into God's house, we need to be clean. Now, if you go to the New Testament, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. So we're told to have clean hands. In the New Testament, the church, we're told, therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So the emphasis moves from having clean hands to having holy hands. Do we know what the difference is between something being clean and something being holy? Well, we're going to look at that this morning. The, the basic principle is something must be clean before it can be holy. God won't allow anything to be holy, because holy means something that belongs to God, unless it's clean first. If you think of things in life, you won't use it unless it's clean first. A knife and fork... You're not going to use it unless it's clean. You want it to be clean first, and then you will use it. It will become yours. So, before we start our worship this morning, we need to make sure we're clean. Well, we're clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. When we confess our sins, you have to confess your sin. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we are clean, then... We are ready to be used by God. And that's when holiness kicks in. And that's actually what God's after. There's lots of things that are clean, but God actually wants things to be holy. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. But let's stand in the presence of the Lord. We're going to lift up our hands to the Lord. Now, this is a good time to emphasize this, because it's the beginning of the year where we can prepare ourselves. But also, because we can't sing... So our praise is very limited. Because we can't interact, we have to worship with basically our expressions, with our heart, with our spirit, and allow our bodies to worship God. So we can use our hands. Our, our hands can be lifted to God. Our hands can be lifted in praise because we can't sing praise. We can lift up clean hands and come into God's presence and receive his blessing. But we can lift up holy hands so that God can use our bodies for his service. So let's just do that now. Let's just prepare ourselves in God's presence. Even before we have a song sung, you just decide how you're going to praise 
God without singing? How are you going to worship God without moving about or using your voices? But we're still going to worship the Lord. The team are going to lead us in songs. And this morning we're going to focus on our holy God and being holy in God's presence. Let's look to the Lord right now. Father, thank you that you have called us to be holy. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us into your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you have gathered us once again today to worship you, to listen to your word, to commune together, Lord, remembering who you are, and to give you all our worship. So, Lord, as the team helps us, Lord, with these songs, let us worship you in holiness. Let us lift up holy hands and let us adore our God, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. The team are going to help us. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, team. to the Lord God is called the Holy One we don't even know what that word really means something beyond our comprehension the holiness of God it just sums up the entirety of his character it denotates who he is and why he's different to everything else because he's holy totally uncontaminated by anything totally different and pure from anything else and yet he calls us into his holy presence having cleansed us 
so that we can be holy. Father, thank you for your holy church, your holy bride. Thank you that we can stand in your holy presence, lifting up holy hands. And we can worship you today, for you are worthy. Receive, Lord, all that praise, glory, and honor, and power, and strength, and wisdom, and thanks. Let it all be unto you, our God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, just wave to someone. That's your social interaction for the week. Don't touch anybody, but signal to them. Then you may take your seats. Praise the Lord. Thank you, team. Okay, it's our month of prayer and fasting, so we're preparing ourselves for what God has for us. How do we prepare ourselves? Lots of different examples in the Bible, prayer, fasting, studying the Scriptures. All these things are a cleansing process in our lives, a cleansing process physically and spiritually. And so last week and throughout the week, we've been looking at being clean. Are we going to be clean for God? If you remember last week, we looked at anything that God is joined to or anything God lives in or anything that's attached to God has to be clean. So God's house has to be clean. God's body, the church, has to be clean. God's bride has to be clean because these are the things God joins himself to and dwells in. Just in a, in a natural sense, we want all those things to be clean. We want clean houses, clean bodies, clean relationships. And anything that isn't clean, we have to confess that so that the blood of Jesus Christ can make us clean. It's got to be through confession of sins so that we can be cleansed. And so we looked at <clears throat> last week about how God is cleaning things up. And I think this crisis we're under is a, is a perfect way God is cleaning things up. Because you've got to be clean. Even in the natural sense, we're having to go through all kinds of different hygiene systems and protocols and medical practices to keep things clean in a physical sense. That's what, So it is in the physical, so it should be even more in the spiritual. Going through this cleansing process. If you resist it, you're not clean. Um, but why? Why clean? Well, because God wants to live in, some, live, in, live in us, dwell in his church, be with us. But there's, there's actually something more God's after. It's not cleaning things for the sake of cleaning things. Perhaps you know someone who likes to clean things for the sake of cleaning things. Yeah? I don't. But, for example, another hypothetical come in here. I, I've heard of someone that even before the family can go on holiday, the house has to be totally cleaned. Do you know anyone like that? Why? We're not there. Who are we cleaning for? The potential burglars? Are we cleaning the house? We're going away for 10 days or a fortnight's holiday, but before we go, we have to spend two days cleaning the house. So that just in case someone breaks in while we're away, the house is clean. Hypothetical, as I said it. I don't actually know anyone like that. But um, God's not like that. God's cleaning for a purpose. Now, the purpose God cleans us for is for holiness. There's a direct link in the Bible between when something's clean, then something can be presented as holy. The example's all the way in the Old Testament, the temple. Everything had to be washed and cleaned and then purified, and then it could be what was called sanctified. Sanctified is the word holy. It's, it's actually exactly um, the same word in Hebrew. It's the word kodesh. It literally means that is now so clean, God will take it as his. Yeah? And that's when it becomes holy. Clean doesn't mean holy. Clean is preparation for holiness. 
When something's clean, then God can take it as holy. Okay? It's a two-part process of purification that God uses. Let me give you an example. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. You'll find this all the way through Scriptures. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. There we go. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, God's given us lots of promises, let us purify, cleanse ourselves <clears throat> from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So if we will be cleansed, if we will be purified that we looked at last week, we're not going to go through that again, then, then we move into holiness out of reverence for God. So once we're cleansed, perfecting there, it means maturing, moving into, um, like having a perfect aim. When you're aiming perfectly, it doesn't mean you're, you're literally perfect. It means you're continuing on the right path. Holiness out of reverence for God. Your aim as a Christian should be holiness. The problem with modern Christianity is the average Christian is looking for happiness, not holiness. The pursuit of happiness will never, will never get you anywhere. But holiness is what you're created to be. Holy is how God made you in God's image. And God is holy. We're created to be holy, but what does this mean? We look at this an awful lot, at least once a year. I'll, I'll bring one message on what holiness is. I know we had one just over a year ago on what holiness is, so I'll try not to repeat all that. But what, what is holiness? Well, when you cleanse, when something's clean, it can be given to someone. Right? Cleansing is what you do, and then when you give it to them, that's holiness. So in, in the in the Bible in the temple, the furniture and the equipment was clean, and then it was given to God. Then it became holy. It became sanctified. It was already clean. Now it's holy. Now it belongs to God. Now it is owned by God. It's sanctification, literally, or, or to make something sacred, it literally means it's separated. So in other words, it's only for God. No one else can have it. You can't walk into the temple and say, well, I'll have some of that bread, because they would say, no, that's sacred bread. That, that's only for God. You can't walk into the temple and say, well, I'll just sit on that golden table, or I'll help my, you know, I'll light the golden candlestick. No, 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 that's, that belongs to God. You can't even go in there. Only God's presence is in there, and only someone who is holy can go in there. So who could go in there? Only the priest. The priest would have a turban on and it would say, it would say, holy unto the Lord. Kadesh. Holy. That man belongs to God. So he was set apart to work for God in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, we're all called to be holy. Because we're all called to be priests. And that doesn't mean we have less of a standard. It means we have a higher standard. Remember, Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you're not going to enjoy the kingdom of God. You're not even going to understand it. Now, I think the best way to understand this is the example that the Bible uses all the time. It's the example of marriage. Ephesians 5, let's go there. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Moving from being cleansed to being holy. You can't just stop at cleaning yourself. You've got to move into holiness. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other, sorry, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. So can you see a two-part process? The bride, the husband, this, this beautiful thing that God has created that's taken to himself is cleansed and then to make her holy so that she has no faults, no blemishes, she's totally clean, but holy and blameless, right? Two-part process, right? On your wedding day, all the women here, you got washed, hopefully, 
I've done a lot of weddings. As far as I can tell, the bride was always immaculate, smelt beautiful, looked totally clean. Everything was perfect. She was clean. But she hadn't given herself to her husband yet. The church is being cleansed and being made holy, verse 26, to make her holy. God is making us holy so that we can be given to him. Obviously, you've got to be clean, but the holiness is when we belong to God, when we've been given to him, clean and holy. Now, once again, uh, modern Christianity tends to not focus on holiness, but that's actually God's aim. You read Revelation in, in heaven, everything's holy. On earth, even, in the temple, everything God is, 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 is saying this is holy. And when people touch things that were holy that they shouldn't have in the Old Testament, you usually find God killed them because they didn't understand holiness. And that's the most important thing God is trying to get us to see. And we emphasize all kinds of things, but God's emphasizing the cleanness of his bride and so the holiness of his bride, Yeah? What do we emphasize today? How many, church, how many people emphasize how big the church is? Now, men, let me ask you a question. Growing up, thinking of the woman you were going to marry, did you think, I want the biggest woman I can find? Do you look at your wife and say, well, I, ju I just wish she'd keep getting bigger? The bigger, the better. I wish she was huge. I wish she, wa I wish she was the biggest wife in the world. No, you don't, you don't put the emphasis on that at all. In fact, most things in your life, it's not how big it is at all. But it's how clean and good it is. That's what you're looking for. And that's what God's looking for in his bride. He's looking for a clean bride and a holy bride. Now, the church is big worldwide, it's absolutely huge. It's actually the biggest organism on the planet, the, the church of the living God, the church of Jesus Christ. But God wants the Kodesh. He wants something that's owned by him. I don't want the biggest house in Yorkshire, but I want a clean house. I want a holy house. I want a house that belongs to me. My family doesn't have to be the biggest, but I want my family to be clean and holy. And that is God's attitude for his house. He wants us clean and holy. He wants it owned by God. Not defiled, not immoral. This is why God's removing sins at this season on a massive scale. Unveiling lots of hidden defects. But there is no defect in Christ. To present himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And that's why God's taking us through this cleansing process that is undeniable now. And we've been going through it now a whole year, as of never before, the whole church. God purifying us so that we can be holy. Okay, let's try and look at aspects of holiness that we've not looked at in the past, because it's such a huge topic. I mean, holiness is what God is. So once again, you can't fully comprehend what God is. When you get into heaven, and there's the, 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 the cherubim there, and, and, and the whole heavenly court, how do they describe God? Holy. What does that mean? Holy, holy, holy. Those songs we've sung this morning all had the word holy in them. It's God's emphasis. It's God's emphasis for you. Do you want it? Do you want to belong to God, to be separated? to be sacred, to be sanctified, to be, to, be, to be long holy to God. 2 Timothy 2, verse 21. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 21. Let's just look at some aspects of holiness and we'll take this on board so that we can decide if this is real in our lives. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy. Who's made holy? Those who've cleansed themselves. Yeah? God can't make you holy if you've, not, if you've not been cleansed. They will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful for the master, and prepared for any good work. God will only use clean things, but God is making you holy. Have you ever tried to make something 
with someone. And what you're trying to make, the person who's helping you is trying to make something else. Think of your kids when you, you know, I think of my, I'll not name one of them because they complain later when I've made them an example of them. Use them as a sermon illustration. That's all pastor's kids are any good for, by the way, using as sermon illustrations. You know, you're digging a sandcastle at the beach, and one of your kids isn't digging to make the sandcastle, they're digging in the sandcastle and chucking the sandcastle back out of what you're building. I mean, how long do you keep doing that before you give up? You know, you're washing muck off the car, they're putting mud on the car. You know, after a while you think, well, I'm trying to make something here, they're trying to make something else. So I'm never going to achieve my end because I'm trying to make this, they're trying to make the opposite. And so it's frustrating what's trying to happen. Well, what's God? What's God's plan for you, for your life? I can tell you what it is. He's, he's making you holy. Now, if you're not cooperating with that, how can God make you holy? It's like cleaning someone while they're still in the mud. We've got to cooperate so that God can make us holy, right? You can't make yourself holy. Because holiness is God, once you, once you cleanse, taking yourself unto himself, yeah? So it's God that does it. You can't tell God, you've got to accept me, because that's what holiness is, God taking it for himself. No, you have to let God do that. Husbands, wash your bride with the water of the word, making her holy as Christ does the church. It's Jesus that's washing you through the word, showing you, what holiness is, so that you can come to him. But if you don't cooperate with that, how can he make it happen? It's not possible. We've got to be in cooperation so that when Jesus is making us something, we will be made that thing. And what is that thing he's making us into? Someone that's holy. Whatever you think your call in life is, or your purpose, or your promise, the one thing, that's all debatable. The one thing that isn't debatable is that God is making you holy. And unless you've been cleansed and made holy, you can't, you can't be used, prepared for any good work. I'm sure you've all been in restaurants and you look at the cup or the knife and fork and it's dirty. What do you do? Well, I don't want to use that. Why? Because it's, it's not clean. If it's not clean, you can't use it. So if it's not clean, it's not, you can't make it holy. You can't use it. So can we understand what these aspects of holiness are? In the, in the Hebrew, it's the word kadesh. It means sanctified, purified, cleanse. It can mean um, uh, dedicated to God. It can mean separated to God. And in the Bible, you'll find certain things are called holy. In fact, the priests were to teach the people the difference between what's holy and what's not. And basically the difference is when something totally belongs to God, it's holy. So it's the holy temple, it's the holy house, it's the holy altar, it's the, it's the holy candle stand, it's the holy bread, it's the holy anointing oil. That, that word's not just used for emphasis to make something sound spiritual. It has a literal meaning. It means who owns it and who it belongs to and what it can be used for. Yeah? That, that's, that's what it means. You know, I've got a... a I'm sure this is not just me, but, you know, in my house, there's different seats, couches, chairs, but then there's my chair. Yeah? Just me, that's weird then. So every morning I get up, and if someone's in my chair, they have to move. Because that's my chair. Yeah? It's holy to me. It belongs to me. No one else should be sat there. Some of you do it in church. That's my chair. It's not actually. It's God's chair. But he'll allow us to uh, have our preferences sometimes. So what's holy? Days can be holy. The Sabbath is a holy day. God said that right at the beginning of creation. You're supposed to give a day to God. You're supposed to not, not decide whether you might think about it. Right? My wife gives herself to me. Not, she doesn't wake up and think, well, shall I belong to Dave today? No, she... She chooses to belong to me. God says you can be on holy ground. Take your shoes off. You're standing on holy. You are now in my presence, right? You better be giving me your attention. Holiness. 
holy places, holy ground, holy days. It's such a massive topic. In the, in the New Testament, it's, it's the Greek word hagios. And if you've ever traveled to Turkey or Greece, uh, because it comes from the Greek language, you'll find places called, you'll find churches called hagios, hagios Sophia, the holy church. Hagios Nicolaus, we stayed in a place once. The holy place of Nicholas, St. Nicholas. And so, do you want to be holy? Right, now, the place to start is always with God himself. All members of the Trinity are called holy. Yeah? You have a spirit within you. No. You have the holy spirit within you. Yeah? Yeah? What's the difference? Oh, there's a massive difference between a spirit and the Holy Spirit, right? God the Father is often called the Holy Father. Jesus is called the Holy Son, your Holy Son, or even sometimes the Holy One of God. In fact, often demon, de demonic spirits, unclean spirits, call Jesus the Holy One of God. That's why they had no authority over him. That's why Jesus could cast out demons, unclean spirits, because he belonged to God. They couldn't do anything about that. When Jesus drives a demon out of his house, as we looked last week, they're out. They can't come back in because that house now belongs to God. When Jesus cleanses you and you now become holy, then the Holy Spirit lives in you because you belong to God. If Jesus just cleanses you and you don't become holy, then anything can come back into the house. Because the house doesn't belong to God. So you can't say, I want my sins forgiven and I want to be cleansed, but then you reject God because then all the things you cleanse from will just come back. It's the Holy Spirit that stops it happening. Because the Holy Spirit will not share his house with anything unclean or anything that belongs to him. Father, Spirit, Son, they are all holy. It's not a rating. It's not like a, a, a one-star, two-star, three-star, four-star rating of holiness you either are or you're not you either belong to them or you don't you belong to something else there's not a standard of holiness it either is or it isn't and that's why in the and i mentioned this last week that's why in the presence of god holy is mentioned three times right when something's mentioned once it's true when something's mentioned twice it's it's emphatically stated as true. So in the old King James, Jesus would say, verily, verily, true, true. Yeah? To emphasize it. But in God's presence, it's, a, it's, a, it's in triplicate. Holy, holy, holy. Just to get us to understand how the Godhead, the Trinity, Holy Father, Holy Spirit, Holy Son, all are totally separate and different. So we're preaching this morning, we're looking at the Bible. No, we're looking at the Holy Bible. On the cover of your Bible, it doesn't say Bible, it says Holy Bible. Why? Because Bible just means book. This is not just a book. These words are totally different to any other words you will ever hear or read. Because they're God's words. And Jesus says his words give life and his words will never pass away. Whatever you read, don't compare it to this book. This is Holy this morning we're going to take communion. No, we're going to take holy communion. Oh, they're just words. It's just an appendage to the word. No, it's to get us to understand the clear distinction between something that's God's and something that isn't God's. His church is called his holy church. The church is not an organization like a country club or a working men's club or, or a sports team. No, it is a separated, sanctified bride and body of Christ that belongs to him and is holy. If it's not holy, it's not part of the church. It doesn't belong to God. Because it's holiness that God is after. You know, you'll find throughout the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, the people of God are called over and over again His holy people. God says, these are my people. They're not just people. They're my people. They're my children. It's my church. God takes it personally and ownership once we accept the reality of 
holiness. That's why in the, in, in the uh, New Testament, there's two baptisms. There was the baptism of cleansing in water, and then there was the baptism, not the baptism in the Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. One is cleansing, the second one is holiness. How is it that Christians, when they emphasize the, whole, the Holy Spirit or spirit baptism, we emphasize all kinds of things. Gifts, prophecy, tongues, power, abilities, manifestation. Whereas actually the emphasis is holiness. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do you know why? God wants you to be holy. He's making you holy. The purpose of the baptism in the Spirit Whatever else happens, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, all those things, wonderful, wonderful gifts and fruit of the Spirit, but the emphasis is holiness. That's why God puts His Spirit on you, to make you holy. You're His bride. You belong to Him now. Look at this, Romans 1, verse 2. Romans 1 and verse 2. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Everything that God does through his word, everything that God is saying through his word, through the Holy Scriptures, is to make you holy. Never ever lose sight of that. If you get a promise from God or a prophecy or a word or whatever, and you think that that is for you, remember that the purpose of that word will only be fulfilled through holiness. In other words, a, a more consecration to God. It won't just happen. It will only happen if you become more devoted, sanctified, and made holy to God. Because God's plan is to make us holy. Always bear that in mind. Don't jump up and down and say, you know, God's given me a great promise, it's going to be wonderful. No, if God's given you a great promise, it's going to be through making you holy ready for the master's use. Okay, let's look at a few aspects of this then before we take communion. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. I love this verse because it's so clear, but yet it seems so unattainable and so many Christians sort of can't really grasp it. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So it's said twice there, but he's actually quoting the Old Testament. Be holy. How do you be holy? It's the easiest thing in the world. But we often think it's the hardest thing. No, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. How are you made clean? When a leper came to Jesus, now remember in, in uh, biblical thought, especially Old Testament, a leper is the most unclean person there is. Right? This is the worst state you can be in. You're so unclean, you have to shout unclean. You're not allowed to walk about unless you shout unclean. You have to wear a mask. Got loads of lepers here this morning. You have to wear, cover your face. You have to, sometimes they'd wear a bell, you know, or a sign saying how unclean they are. I mean, that's a pretty good level of uncleanness. But when the lepers came to Jesus, what did they say? Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What did the leper do to be clean? He let Jesus make him clean. Didn't clean himself up. Didn't go and buy some wonderful Ahava skin products and spend thousands of pounds on, you know, skin preparation. No, what did Jesus do? He, he touched him. He let Jesus touch him. And because Jesus touched him, what did Jesus say when he touched him? Be clean. Well, that's not possible. You can't cleanse yourself from leprosy. Yeah, you can when Jesus does it. What happened as soon as Jesus said, be clean? He was cleansed from his leprosy. And Jesus says, now go to the authorities and get the certificate and prove you are clean. How do you be holy? Exactly the same way. 
It's not a system of religious rites you have to go through. It's, it's not a system of religious observance. It is you letting the Holy Spirit come into you. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Once the Holy Spirit comes into you, you belong to God and you are made holy. It's imputed holiness. It's because God can do it. Just as he who called you, if God calls you, he gives you the power and ability to fulfill the call. God will never call you to something you can do yourself because then you would get the glory. You might say to God be the glory, but in your heart you'd think, I did this by my own efforts and talents. No, if God calls you, he is the one who will fulfill it through you. It won't be by your manipulations or your string pulling or your hard work. It's not by, never by works, it's always by faith. It's always by believing what God is going to do us. So what do we do? We just cooperate with him. We just let him do it. He's the expert. I love it how Reinhard Bonnke used to say, when people say how he did all these miracles and, and uh, see all these you know, people healed when he was preaching the gospel. And Reinhard Bonnke used to say, no, it's the Holy Spirit who does it. He's the divine surgeon. I'm just the nurse giving him what he wants. So when the doctor says scalpel, you hand the scalpel. When the doctor says this, or the sur you, you just cooperate with him. He's the one doing the divine surgery. He's the one prescribing the medication. You're the nurse. You're just doing what he says. You're just fulfilling what the prescription is and cooperating with him. He is the one who is making us holy. It's not us doing it. So one of the best examples, I mean, that's a theological statement of what we're to be, but one of the best examples is found right at the beginning of the gospel. So go to Luke chapter 21 and verse 35. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. Chapter 1. So this is the angel Gabriel coming to Mary. And the angel has just told her she's going to uh, become pregnant and give birth to the Son of God. Well, how's that going to happen? I mean, she's a virgin. It can't happen. It's impossible. It's, it's no different to when God says to you, be holy. Well, how's that going to happen? That's not possible. You, you don't know all the faults I've got. Oh, he does. And he knows the ones you don't know about. The angel answered, this is how it will happen. The Holy Spirit, not the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So, how does Mary fulfill this promise that God wants to do through her? It's the easiest thing in the world. She lets the Holy Spirit come upon her. Yeah? She lets the power of the Most High overshadow her. She comes into the presence of God. So she comes into the presence, and then the presence of God comes into her, and then the Holy One, this holy thing that needs to be done inside of her. Remember Jesus, the incarnation, that God becoming man, could not be contaminated in any way, or he wouldn't be holy. So he couldn't even inherit sins from his dad. He had to be totally pure, totally righteous to take away the sin of mankind. He had to have no blemish. Totally clean, totally pure. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So how does she do it? She comes into the presence of God. The presence of God comes into her. And then within her, this holy thing, this Holy One, this holiness is now in her. So she's the house now of God because God's living in her. She's the temple. She's the body. 
she belongs to God. Why? Because God's literally living in her. By the Holy Spirit, the Holy One is now in her. So how does, how does that come out? Well, it just does. Now, I don't pretend to fully understand how all this works, even in a natural sense. You know, as a man, I'm not quite sure um, how childbirth really feels and how it works and what happens, but it just does, doesn't it? And it looks a, 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 a brilliant load of fun from my observation. What a laugh that seems, giving birth. It's, God's done it all. What does she do? She just says, be unto me according to your word. She just lets God do it. But she has to cooperate. She has to come into God's presence. She has to let the Holy Spirit uh, come and dwell within her. She has to let that pregnancy go. She has to choose not to abort it at any stage because it's uncomfortable and the consequences on her life are going to be massive. People are going to accuse her of all kinds of stuff, but then it's going to come out. And it's still holy then when it comes out. When Jesus comes out, he's holy. Why? Because it was the Holy Spirit that did it. It's the Holy Spirit that incubated it. It's the Holy Spirit that conceptualized it. It's the Holy Spirit that grew it. And it's the Holy Spirit that births it. So it's all holy from beginning to end. It was the Holy Word from a holy angel that came to a clean woman. That's how God does it. He comes on us, he comes in us, and then he comes out of us. Romans 11, verse 16. Romans 11, verse 16. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. The apostle here is talking about how if Jesus is holy, then everything that comes out of Jesus is holy. If the tree's holy, the fruit's holy. A piece of bread, if the, if the, if the first bit of dough, that you, that's fine, then the rest of the bread's fine. So if Jesus is really in you, what's going to come out of you is holy. If it's Jesus. If it's the Holy Spirit in you, then what's moving through you is holy. If it's the Holy Spirit. If we're cooperating. It can't be something else. Because God always honours who he is. And so it's Christ... Christ is the first fruits, which is holy. Christ is the tree, which is holy. Christ is the fruit, which is holy. Christ is in you, which is holy. And it's Jesus coming through you by the Holy Spirit, which is holy. Don't think holiness is like, oh, he's a holy person. We're all supposed to be holy people. The, the problem is, are we cooperating? Have we been cleansed? Are we in submission to the process God is taking us through because he is making us holy? That's his aim. Ephesians 1 verse 4, Paul tells all the churches this, Ephesians 1 and verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us. So what's God's plan for you? To be holy. Now, you don't think you're up to it. It doesn't matter. God there, for he chose you to be holy. This doesn't start with you. This is not your personal pursuit of holiness. This is not you trying to attain holiness. This is God's choice. God has picked you. The fact that you're here proves God's picked you. The fact that you're listening to God's word proves he's, he's chosen you. So he's chosen you to be holy. Don't fall into this, you know, this false humility of oh I, i'm not good enough i'm not i'm not worthy enough to be holy god's chose you to be holy if god decides to use you he's going to use you if god has picked you he's going to pick you and he's picked you to be holy you are you are chosen as part of god look at acts 13 verse 34 acts 13 verse 34 i'm, I'm basically cancelling out all your excuses because i know what christians are like they, they, they make holiness this somehow incremental standard of scale where, oh, he's really holy, but I'm not. Well, that's not how it works. We either belong to God or we don't. We're either cooperating or we're not. We're either allowing him to make us holy or, or we, we, we're kicking against it and doing the opposite. 
once we've been cleansed. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, God's already said this, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Verse 34, God doesn't give you promises and blessings. He gives you holy promises and blessings. What's the difference? Massive difference. Enormous difference. It's not just a promise, and it's not just a blessing. It's a holy promise. And it's a holy blessing. God's promise for you is holy. In other words, God's saying, I will do this, and you will belong to me. And the, the, the promise I give you, if you will belong to me, you'll get it. Because Jesus has already got it. You will not let your Holy One see decay. So Jesus promises you, you eternal life. You've already got it. Why? Because the Holy One has already conquered death. So, so have you. Because you belong to God. You've already got eternal life. We're not experiencing its fullness yet, but we've already got it. Just as Mary already had the Holy Jesus within her, but she hadn't birthed it yet, but she still had it. it was, he was still alive within her. The same Jesus who would die on the cross was the same Jesus inside Mary. It had just not grown yet into its fullness, but it was still there. The blessings, they're not just blessings, they're holy blessings. Again, we use that word, bless you. Well, when God blesses you, it's not just a blessing, it's a holy blessing. It's not just a distant bless, it's an embrace. It's saying, bless you, you are mine. You now a part of my holiness. We tend to think as a bless you as a nice way of saying push off. Bless them. Which really means just get them away. No, God's the opposite. God's blessed them. They're mine. They're part of my holy blessing. I know we can't hug each other at the moment, but God can hug you because He's making you holy. And holiness is the embrace of God. Okay, let's bring this to a close then. Two more. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Thinking of just everything we've looked at, and there's so much more to look at of holiness. Whatever you're doing... You've got to be holy. We all want peace. We want to live in peace with people. Yes, but you've got to be holy. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then it lists things that will cancel that out. Sexual immorality, bitterness, defilement, all these things. Esau didn't get them. Why didn't he get them? Because he didn't want to be holy. Did he want the blessings? Yes. He wanted the blessings. He wanted the inheritance. He wanted the promises. But he didn't want to be holy. So he couldn't have them. He wanted to just do his own thing. Without holiness, no one will see God. Why? Because God is holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In the presence of God, the thing that's emphasized, not just a bit, but above everything else, is his holiness. We're going to take communion this morning. But before we do that, I want us to just appreciate God's holiness and cooperate with the fact that God's making us holy. Just go back to this then. Romans 12, verse 1. Then we're going to worship the Lord and take communion. Romans 12 and verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy. Now, we could have, they could have used any word there to describe our worship, but he uses the word holy. Holy and pleasing to God. This is, listen to this, this is your true and proper worship. 
What is? Holiness. Giving your body in holiness. Worship singing a song. Worship's got nothing to do with singing a song. Worship is to do with giving your body in holiness to God. That's why even though, because of the COVID regulations, even though we can't sing, we can still worship. Why? Because we can give ourselves into God's holiness. We can receive it. We can let God make us holy. Having cleansed ourselves as we confess our sins, we can please God by worshipping him in the beauty of his holiness, the word tells us. So before we take holy communion, we're going to worship God. Let's just stand together in the presence of the Lord. We stand in God's holy presence. In his holy church, his holy people, his holy body, his holy bride. Why holy? Because we belong to God. We're going to take holy communion. We're going to take the holy bread and the holy wine. Because God is making us holy by his Holy Spirit. Let's take the bread. Take the bread in your hand. The unleavened bread in the temple was holy bread, consecrated, sacred. Only the priests could, could eat it. Because the priests were holy. So as we're holy by the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we take the bread. Let's take the bread together. the holy cup this is the holy wine representing the holy blood of Jesus Christ nothing more holy than this but yet God poured it out for us for the forgiveness of our sins let's take the wine Let's look to the Lord. Father, thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit so that we can live holy and blameless lives, worshipping you as you are making us holy. We want to be holy. We choose to be holy because we are holy because of the work you have done in us. Lord, may the results of that holiness flow out from us and bring blessing and the sense of your reality to other people. Now, Lord, let your holy church be blessed this week as they serve you wherever they are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all.